Hey, this is attorney Elizabeth Potts Weinstein, and today we're going to talk about the seven one owner S corporation mistakes. Most of these issues come from the fact that as a one owner business, or even if there's just two or three owners, you don't have a lot of accountability to other owners, especially owners who are not closely tied to you in any way. It means that people tend to be less formal about their corporation, which is a big mistake. Number one, co-mingling. You probably have heard about this before if you've done any research about your S corporation, but if you have a corporation or an LLC for that matter, you must keep its finances separate from your personal finances. So how does that look? It needs to have its own bank account. It needs to have bookkeeping of some kind, whether it's on a piece of paper or formal bookkeeping on some website like QuickBooks, where you are accounting for the fact that this corporation and you are separate financially. It means that if the corporation makes a profit, you don't just take that profit directly out of the checking account of the business to buy groceries. You don't just use the debit card for your corporation to buy clothes for yourself or groceries or personal non-business travel. If the business is making money, it pays you as the owner or as an owner employee, which we're going to talk about a little later, some kind of distribution and or salary, and you use that money to buy your groceries or pay your rent or whatever it is. Once I had a client where they had a corporation and it was owned by the husband and wife, and they had been using that corporate account for everything. They would go to Costco and buy all kinds of stuff that were not businessy things, that were personal things. They would use that for the grocery store. They would use it for everything. And their attitude was, well, there's no other owner, so why does it matter? If you do that, you will lose all protection of that corporation, and forming the corporation was a waste of your time. They will pierce the corporate veil and you will be personally liable for everything the corporation does. It is a horrible red flag, so don't do it. All you gotta do is set up its own checking account, maybe even its own credit card, and keep some kind of bookkeeping records of how it pays you instead of you just using the money for whatever you want. Item number two is a formality. This is not having bylaws and minutes of your director and shareholder meetings. Now you might say to me, Look, Elizabeth, I know I'm the only director. I'm the only shareholder. Am I going to have a meeting with myself? And my answer is yes, you are going to have a meeting with yourself. Okay. You are going to sit down and have a meeting that I know that's ridiculous and weird. Fundamentally, you're just going to read these minutes. You're just going to read these declaration decisions, whatever it is. And you're going to sign that this is what happened. I get that the meeting is just with yourself in your head, but that formality is required to show that the corporation is separate from you, that you go through the formal process of having a director's meeting or shareholders meeting, both of them usually at the same time, once a year, and whenever you need to make big decisions. Legally speaking, here in California, a corporation isn't required to have bylaws, which are like, it's like the, the constitution for the corporation but I highly recommend you do that. It, there are tens of templates and forms online that you can use. And because that's going to be the rules that the corporation uses to make decisions and have votes. And I get that the vote is just you and it's going to be unanimous, but you still want a written record of everything. Item number three, which is related, is not having meetings to make big decisions about your business. Meetings where you have the minutes for the director or shareholders. So what I'm talking about here is not everyday decisions about your business, not decisions about what marketing you're going to do or what services you're going to provide. I'm talking about things that are extraordinary, that are outside the normal scope of business. So for example, let's say you need to get a loan. Let's say we're having another situation and you're going to get a loan from the government, an emergency loan to help you get through this situation. You need to have a meeting of the board of directors, which I get maybe just you, <laughs> to make that decision and you need to have minutes of that meeting, okay? So big things like signing a 10-year lease, 
taking out a loan, deciding to buy another business, sell parts of your business, things that aren't just kind of normal parts of your business need to have a paper trail. Item number four is a mistake that people make when they start the corporation. And this is not creating the right kind of entity. I'm not talking about the right from a strategic perspective because there's a lot of right answers in there. I'm talking about you're not allowed to have that kind of entity. So for example, here in California, I'm a lawyer. I can't form just a regular corporation or a regular LLC. I have to form a professional corporation. What does that mean? I'm a licensed attorney, and this is also true for many other licensed professions here in California. I have to have a special kind of corporation, not a regular corporation. Typically, this also comes up for other licensed professions like people in the medical field, but it can be many licensed professions and you have to check in your state if your services fall on that list of professional services that might need a special kind of corporation or even LLC. Now, in my case, my corporation is still an S Corp from a tax perspective, but it's a professional corporation from a legal perspective. Number five is not filing annual reports or whatever is required in your state. Almost every state, if not every state, has some kind of annual filing for corporations where you update them on any changes in your address, in the name of the business, in who the CEO is, all that kind of stuff, and you have to pay them some kind of money. This could be called a annual report. It could be called a statement of information. It could be called an annual registration. Every state has to have its own name for this, but just remember that there's probably some kind of annual filing you're going to have to do with your state. It might be based on the one year anniversary of when you created a corporation, or it could be something that's due every calendar year and they make everyone file at the same time, which may be in January or it could be in July, who knows. But the idea is check with your state where you created your corporation to see, and that check on their website, to see if you need to do an annual filing because you probably do. And if you don't do your annual filing, a number of things can happen. Number one is you'll have all kinds of extra fees. You'll have some kind of penalty. It could be hundreds of dollars you have to pay because you missed your filing. The second thing that can happen is that your corporation can be administratively dissolved. Yet you don't want that, okay? What that, means, what that means is during the time you're technically dissolved administratively, your corporation doesn't have liability protection anymore. This is something you want to fix as soon as you can. Typically, you can fix this by paying the state a whole bunch of money. You have to pay them some kind of uh, un dissolution, unadministrative dissolution fee, whatever they call that there. You have to pay the penalties. You have to pay for the thing that you didn't file. There's usually a way to fix it within a certain time frame but you need to get on that. Otherwise, there was no point in you having this corporation. Number six related to this annual requirement is not filing annual tax returns, whatever those are called in your state. In some states, you may have to file a income tax return for that S corporation. Some states don't have income tax returns, but they might have another kind of tax that you have to file each year, some kind of franchise tax. The thing is, they're going to find a way to charge you a couple hundred bucks every single year. And you need to find out what filing needs to happen for that S corporation. The thing is, it's true that an S corporation has, has passed through tax to you as the owner. So for example, when I make a profit with my law firm, the, whether or not I distribute that profit to me, whether or not I actually take that money out and give it to myself, I have it have to personally pay taxes on that profit on my personal 1040 tax return. The corporation gives me a K1, which is a statement that has all that has you know a bunch of things on it, including the bottom line of whether or not I need profit or loss. And that goes on my personal tax return. But the S corporation still has to file a tax return with the federal government in DC, the IRS, and also with the state of California. And it may not have to pay its own taxes, but it has to do that filing. Now in California, it also has to pay a franchise fee to the state of California with that for $800 a year, regardless of whether how much profit it makes. That's the minimum. It could be more if you make a lot of profit. 
So check with your tax preparer. Hopefully you have a tax preparer that helps you with business taxes to see if that filing has been done. Number seven is related to this financial issue too, which is not paying the owner employee a salary. So if you have a business that's just you, the one owner, and you also work in the business, you do the work of the business, you're not like a passive investor in this business, you actually do the work. You're not just an owner, you're also an employee. And when you have an S corporation, any profits the corporation makes that you wanna take home so you can pay your rent, has to be distributed to you, not just in profit distributions to you as the owner, but also as a salary for the work that you're doing. Now, most likely as an owner, you kind of wear two different hats. Well, you wear all the hats, but part of what you're doing as an owner is the work of the business. At me, for my law firm, I'm being a lawyer, right? But part of the work I do in my business as is as a owner. If I had other lawyers doing all the legal work, as an owner, I would still have certain management aspects of the business that would be me acting as an owner and not me acting as an employee worker bee. So I pay most of the money out to me as a lawyer, as a salary, and I actually run payroll on a weekly basis because I like getting paid every week. But you can do it on a monthly basis, some people do it quarterly, some people even do a big, big chunk at the end of the year. But I pay myself a salary where everything is taken out, Social Security, FICA, all that jazz. And then if I have extra profit at the end of the year, then I do a profit distribution to me as the owner. On that, you don't have to pay self-employment tax. This is the reason the IRS will come after you if you're paying yourself everything as a distribution and not paying self-employment tax on it because they know that you actually need to do that. They think you're, you're trying to scam them and not pay all those extra payroll taxes. So you need to find some kind of balance paying yourself as an employee as well as paying yourself as an owner. How much money that needs to be really depends on the situation, the kind of work you do, how much money your business makes overall, and also your tolerance for risk. Again, this is attorney Elizabeth Potts Weinstein. If you have any questions about your S corporation, feel free to ask them below and I'll try to point you in the right direction. Thumbs up if you found this video helpful and subscribe if you'd like any more tips for your S corporation or any other aspects of small business law. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye-bye.